Watch this. Only five days until the 2022 May primary, and Idaho election offices are getting all the equipment and all the processes ready. So we ran down to the clerk's office to make sure that the equipment is running correctly and accurately. A last minute lawsuit over poll watchers during early voting. But is it a moot point with only one day left in early voting? Despite an increase in funding from the Idaho legislature, Idaho is once again at the bottom of the class when it comes to funding for both students and teachers. So what needs to change to get Idaho closer to the top? We are five days out from the May primary election, so only five more days of those TV ads, right? Well, this means that early voting for most counties does end tomorrow on Friday. So if you are planning to vote early, make your plans to get out and vote. And if you're holding on to an absentee ballot, make sure that you go drop it off at your county clerk's office just to make sure it arrives on time. You don't want to take a gamble on the mail system. But despite it being just a few days until Election Day, there are lawsuits happening right now regarding the election, and the most recent, filed by Representative Priscilla Giddings. Giddings, who is running for lieutenant governor, filed a civil lawsuit last Friday against a number of people, including the current Secretary of State, Lawrence Denny, as well as a number of county clerks across our area. That does include the clerk in Ada, Boise, Bannock, Canyon, and Twin Falls. So the reason for all of this, let's head to the documents. According to the lawsuit, they're saying, quote, to permit poll challengers and poll watchers to engage in certain activities during the already underway absentee and early voting phase of the primary election. Giddings is saying that the elected officials in the Secretary of State's office are not allowing them to do things the way they'd like to. Now, currently, under Idaho code, each party can pick one person to be a poll watcher on election day and during a partisan election. Now, those people are allowed to be at the polls to watch poll workers count and receive votes. There's another job here. A poll challenger is someone who can challenge voters as to their qualifications. But in order to be present, the county chairman and the secretary of the political party must submit a written request to the county clerk no later than 12 days before an election. But there is really nothing in Idaho code about early voting or absentee ballot signature checks, for example. So what Representative Giddings is asking for is for both watchers and challengers to be present during early voting and during the collection and verification of absentee ballots as they come into the offices at the clerk's offices. And that's something that will end tomorrow, the early voting period as we talk about. So Giddings petitioned for an ex parte hearing, meaning that she wanted the court to fulfill her request to let them do what they want to before allowing other parties to respond. And the court said no to that idea and some documents. The attorneys for the respondents, including Mr. Denny and the county clerks, well, they tell us this. They say Representative Giddings did not tell them about the lawsuit and that this could have been done in a much different way through a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction. So it goes on and the judge agreed, sort of. Judge Jason Scott says that the court is quote unquote unpersuaded that there is any substantial evidence to proceed without allowing the respondents to well, respond. So a hearing was set for four o'clock today saying that candidate Giddings should be prepared to further explain her position on the issues during the hearing. So that hearing, it started about an hour ago, and I'll tell you this, at last check, it is still going on with both uh, the collection of people inside the courtroom. You can see here with Representative Giddings sitting closest to us, uh, and that's her lawyer right there. On the far side of the room, you have representatives for the county clerks we mentioned, as well as a representative for the Secretary of State. Both sides are kind of getting their pieces out there right now. You can see the judge, he's in there listening. He's really driving home to the Giddings defense. He's asking, what exactly would you like me to do about this situation? At last check, the defense for the Secretary of State and the county clerks were saying that they were taking a real quick look at everything. And I am just hearing from my producer, Danny, that in the last few minutes, the judge in this case has actually dismissed the whole thing. So long story short, everything we just told you about, you can throw it away because the case has been dismissed. But it does bring up an important question that county clerks were going to have to likely address at the state legislature. Will they create a system for, I guess, poll watchers to go in and look at absentee ballots as they're being uh, verified on the signature. Because when you send your absentee ballot back through the mail, there's a signature that goes on it, and that signature is eventually checked at the county clerk's office. We're going to get more into this as the whole situation unfolds, but the uh, lawsuit that Giddings did file 
just dismissed moments ago, breaking here at 5 o'clock. All right, so we are five days out from the primary election, and county clerks across the state, they're getting ready for the big day. Oh, we know it. For example, though, today in Ada County, the Ada County elections team hosted a public transparency event. It's called the Logic and Accuracy Test, and it's held before every single election. The premise here is to test the election and tabulation machines to make sure that they're running accurately before the election. Now, to learn more about the concept and how it all works, we sat down with Ada County Chief Deputy Clerk Trent Triple. For a handful of days out from the election, uh, what are you guys working on here today before the election? Today is one of our most important steps in preparation for the election. It's called the logic and accuracy test. And what we're doing is we're testing all of our equipment to make sure that it's accurate uh, and that the software that is running it is uh, doing the correct logic and, and tallying the votes properly. And this is something that you do before every election and it's open to the public. Why is it so important that the public have access to making sure the machines work before the election? Well, we're all about transparency. We want people to feel like they can trust uh, government, especially the elections process. Uh, and so there's no secrets with us. Uh, we want people to know that the machines that we're working uh, with are working properly and that they're tallying votes properly. And so this is an opportunity for the public to come in and see that process actually play out. Uh, and they'll see us go through the whole process that we'll go through on election night uh, to be able to tally all the votes. And I imagine coming out of the logic and accuracy testing, you fix anything that needs to be fixed, and then is it head down into Tuesday? Uh, well, hopefully out of the logic and accuracy test, there isn't anything to fix. Uh, we've been through several iterations of this, and this is just the public display of what will happen. Uh, once we finish that test, all of our equipment goes on lockdown until election day. And so no one will have access to it, including ourselves, uh, to ensure that nothing changes between now and then. We know in recent years with COVID and you know, voting through the mail, the turnout has looked different than in years past with so many people using absentee ballots. Do you have a, a mark on what absentee and early voting looks like so far in Ada County? So far, we've had a, a significant uptake in absentee uh, requests. We've had 25,000 this year so far, or for this election, significantly higher than the last time we had a primary uh, that didn't involve a, a president. Our, our early voting is pretty average turnout so far. Uh, we're expecting overall for this election about a 30% turnout. We know that voters in Ada County, uh, some people might have new polling places, some people may you know, have to figure out exactly where they need to go. Any general advice for voters heading into Tuesday that want to vote at the polls? Yes, please uh, check the website, uh, adacountyelections.com for your location. Almost everyone's precinct has changed. There's a few lucky that haven't, um, but uh, the new precincts based off redistricting are important for people to know so it's not a hassle on election day. You end up at the right place and you get to cast your vote. And we'll show you some video right now. This is from the logic and accuracy test. It was at two o'clock today, so this is fresh. The end result was a great one for the election team. The system ran the test perfectly. That means that the system caught expected errors that were intentionally put on the ballots. The system also correctly tabulated and tallied the votes, matching the results a hand count would have had if you were to take the same batch. So long story short, in a display open to the public, the system showed it works and is ready for election day. The logic and accuracy test isn't done just once. Oh, no. It will run again the morning of the election on Tuesday as well as after the polls close. And that ensures that the systems are working properly and that they did work properly throughout the election. Now, there was one member of the public, other than the media, there watching today. You might have seen him in our video. And he asked some questions about the systems and tabulations. That's some great questions. But the whole thing to me shows that if you have doubts or concerns, ask about them respectfully. The county clerks want to talk to you. They have nothing to hide. Changing topics. Yesterday, we told you about the Nampa School Board voting to ban 22 books from its library shelves. And after what happened during the legislative session, with some lawmakers wanting to ban some books from libraries, we wanted to know if other school districts have banned books from their shelves. So we reached out to a few school districts in our area through public records requests to see if any parents had challenged any books during the school year outside of Nampa. Now, today, we did hear back from West Ada. 
and they have a different process than Nampa when it comes to removing books. Here's what we can tell you. Under the West Ada policies, if a complaint is received, the school will try and resolve the issue informally. That could mean a meeting with the principal or other appropriate staff. If an agreement can't be reached, then that complaint will go to the Standing Instructional Resources Committee within 30 days. Now that committee then evaluates the book and then makes a recommendation. Should it stay, should it go? If no agreement is reached, then a formal challenge can be filed and that will go to the Formal Reconsideration Committee. As it turns out, they have gotten a few challenges recently, and they actually have removed two different books from West Data. Those books are genderqueer and the book called This Book is Gay. So what do those books entail? Well, uh, genderqueer is a graphic novel memoir about what it's like to be non-binary and asexual. In February, the standing committee originally voted to keep the book on the shelf, with some members saying that the overall strengths of this graphic memoir outweigh the weaknesses, adding that they felt that the, quote, avant-garde graphics and some language in the book were not intended to be graphic. Other members wanted a book without the graphics, but a formal challenge was filed in March, and the formal reconsideration vote on the committee, it went seven to one to remove it from all the shelves in the district. So that book is now gone. Also in February, the district received a challenge, not from a parent or relative, but there you can see it, a concerned resident of the West Data School District. And it was regarding a book in the Centennial High School Library called This Book is Gay, which is about what it's like to grow up as a gay person. Now the challenger said that they had read the book in its entirety, but that they were challenging it because of a quote, concern about what I'm hearing about other public elementary and secondary schools. The standing committee originally voted to keep the book on the shelf, but a formal challenge was filed. So the formal reconsideration committee reviewed it and in a five to four vote, they decided that the book did not align with the West Ada educational criteria. The district says that two other books have been challenged this year, one called If I Stay, but that challenge was upheld. The other book, a book called Who Was Harriet Tubman, but not for the reason you may think. According to public records, the district is using a 2002 version of the book and they're hoping for a more up-to-date version to make sure that they have the most accurate information. What serves as a reminder that challenges to books aren't always meant to be a negative or super controversial thing. Now, by the way, we're still waiting to hear back from other school districts in the Treasure Valley as well as the Nampa School District. If any of you are watching here at five o'clock, we'd love to talk to you. For now though, viewers, we'll keep you updated and we'll see what we hear. The state of Idaho is at the bottom of the class in spending, again. So, what's it going to take to get us near the top of the class? See that number on your screen? Yeah, that one right there. Use it to join the 208 conversation. You can text us or call us. Leave us a voicemail at this number if you want. 208-321-5614. Don't forget to include your name in the hashtag the 208 before hitting send and make sure you send with caution we may share your message on air live at the end of the show.
The rankings from the National Teachers Union on teacher pay and school fundings are in Idaho for the second year in a row. Placed dead last on the per pupil spending or per student funding spending, I should say. Now, Idaho also ranks uh, 45th in average teacher salary. The, lo the low rankings are becoming the new norm, so to speak. But why? And what do Idaho policymakers believe can pull us out from being underfunded or less funded? Here's our Katya Stepovic. In the National Education Association's annual rankings and estimate report from 2020 to 2021, the national average spent per student was over $14,000. Idaho spending per student was $8,376, which brought the state to dead last, number 51. There has been a long-standing uh, neglect, honestly, of, of public education in Idaho. Unfortunately for some policymakers, the ranking doesn't come as a surprise. We've been there for a while, and we're going to have to really have a long, hard conversation on how we improve that. The average salary for public school teachers across the country was $65,000. Idaho's average teacher salary was around $51,000, coming in at number 45 in the country. Unfortunately, we were one of three states where they declined our salaries when you put inflation on there. And then you're saying you want professional teachers. Well... There's a two-edged sword. One of the most important measures for student success is having an experienced, um, uh, uh, well-supported educator in the classroom. Mike Journey, spokesperson for the Idaho Education Association, says the findings of the below-average salaries come at a time where over half of Idaho teachers are considering leaving the industry. We are still way, way behind, and we still have a long way to go in order to bring Idaho on par um, with other states, especially the surrounding states, where our educators can go to work for much more money, for better benefits. Representative Sally Toon on the Senate Education Committee says it starts by updating Idaho's funding formula. According to Toon, the state divvies out a set amount of funding to school districts. And if it's not enough, local school districts have to run supplemental levies to make up the difference in the funding, which she believes can be problematic. We have to look real quick real close at the funding formula. Because when we have districts such as Blaine County, Coeur d'Alene that have property values that are very, very high, and when they pass a levy, they can pass it for more when you have population, when you have a district that has, I'll take Dietrich again, you know, or Bliss Idaho that has 180 students. You don't have the ability to collect that tax. I would like to see it, the funding formula be readjusted to account for our student numbers. Truly, let's talk about a small school district, whether we have 10 kids in that classroom or 30 kids, it's going to cost the same. Chairman of the House Education Committee, Lance Clow, says that won't be enough. Changing the funding formula by itself doesn't solve a problem. It's more money into the formula that, that solves the problem. And he says more money is coming. We are on a glide path to make dramatic changes to teacher salaries. And you can find that in the Idaho code, which, uh, which I shared with you. So uh, you can see that over the next few years, there's going to be dramatic in increases in the appropriations from the state. The recent rankings don't reflect the 12.5% increase in K-12 through funding that was approved in Idaho's most recent legislative session. I think it's hard to move the needle uh, when you know that other states, especially towards the bottom, are investing more and more every year also. But the ranking report didn't move Idaho down in every category. Idaho ranked 29 when it comes to salaries for starting teachers, with an average of 39842 slightly below the national average. And some are encouraged that additional state funding in years to come will only increase the good work coming out of Idaho schools. Our members are very appreciative to policymakers for what happened this past legislative session. It will change some of those numbers a few slots because every time you go up one or two, the morale and the nice side of our public education system, we have to, you know, ring the bell on because those are wins.
Now, the State Board of Education is taking approach looking ahead. They did send me a statement. I'll read it to you. It says, in part, the State Board is focused right now on how we best leverage the 12.5% increase in state funding for education provided by the legislature and the governor early this year. That's that 12.5% you heard. Now, it may be the biggest single-year investment in the state education funding in the history of our state, and we believe it will make a big difference for students, teachers, and our public education system as a whole. So now we'll just have to see if that 12.5 increase gets Idaho up on all these rankings. Well, it's really interesting, too, because you have two sides of this argument. Some people say you need to throw more money at this. We need to invest more. Others say we don't need more money. We just need to utilize the money right. we already have better. Mm -hmm. And so. we're just going to have to see what practice works out. Yeah. It sounds like more funding is not a bad thing at this point. No, well, I'll tell you, the educators we talk to will never say no to extra money if it'll help you know, invest in their classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, Kati, I know we'll stay on top of this, especially into the legislature. For now, though, we will step aside. The 208 continues right after this. Ooh, we 82 on Sunday. You'll catch me outside. Well, living in Idaho, we are pretty used to wildlife showing up in urban areas. Not often, but it does happen. Remember that bear a few years ago? For example, like when the weather starts to change and herds of deer are making their way back up to the hillside, sometimes you'll see them in the middle of the road or in neighborhoods right near the foothills. Completely normal. But most people would not expect to come home to a giant bovine in their driveway. How about this? It happened last Friday morning near Park Lane in Floating Feather. This is near Eagle High School. Take a look. A stray steer with a rope around its horn somehow ended up in a nearby neighborhood, and apparently it started to cause some trouble. Eagle police say that the steer actually started walking into traffic and posting up next to homes. 
like you can see here, just kind of some loitering. He even uh, did a little, he's a little damaged, a little feisty, and he did get into the bumper of an officer's SUV. So a little bit of a bovine run in there, but it actually took about two hours to get the, the bovine, the little cow guy. It took him two hours to get him to cooperate. And eventually a brand inspector was called to rope him in into a waiting trailer. So it's a good reminder, if you live in rural parts of Idaho where pastures and farms are nearby, Keep an eye out for loose farm animals. Do not approach them. Don't go try and pet them. Call the experts and call 911 dispatch and tell them what the deal is. All right, let's take a look at some of your comments to finish off the half hour. This person says, when it comes to paying our teachers, it's not about changing the formula, it's about paying more money. That's Jim in Boise. Thanks for the comment there, Jim. One more to send us home. This person says, there's a Julie A. Ellsworth on the Republican ballot. There's a Jill L. Ellsworth running for the same position as Democrat. Is this legit? Yes, these are two separate people that just happen to have very similar names. Um, the idea has now been thrown out that maybe we try to get them in the same room together and show you that before Election Day. Um, if we're able to put that together, we'll do that here on the 208. But yes, Jill and Julie Ellsworth, different people. We're going to get to more of your questions tomorrow on the Friday 208 edition. For now, though, take care of each other. Have a good Thursday night. We'll be back here tomorrow right before 5.